yeah, makes this guy look tiny. OK, how are we on time? Are we ready to start? OK. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for coming out uh, today. Uh, we're going to be talking tonight, today about planning an enterprise OpenStack deployment. Uh, my co-presenter today is going to be Mr. Jeff Applewhite uh, from NetApp over here. Uh, we're going to start off, I'm going to talk about just some general uh, things that we've, we've been, you know, Susan's been doing uh, OpenStack for, what, three and a half years now at this point, something like that. Uh, and uh, we, we've had lots of conversations with customers, uh, and <clears throat> we've seen that there's a couple of common themes that have come out in terms of what people need to do to be able to prepare for an OpenStack uh, deployment. Uh, so we're going to talk about some of those kind of general things uh, from my standpoint. I will talk about some specific details about how, what decisions you make now, how that's going to impact you down the line. Uh, but, uh, but it will be somewhat general. And then uh, Jeff is going to actually talk about uh, some work that he has done on reference architecture uh, with uh, SUSE Cloud and uh, SUSE OpenStack Cloud and NetApp uh, and some of his real world experiences and, and how he can help, uh, how, how he managed to, to, to do things. So <clears throat> should be fun. Should be exciting. Right? Everybody's excited? Woo! -hoo! Yeah. Now, just for the record, I had this a lot more fun. I had like all these cool images in my deck last night that uh, that uh, had like little comic book characters for each of the different things I was going to go through. You know, like you know when you're, you ask yourself a question, there's a picture of the Riddler and stuff like that. And then I chickened out. I decided that uh, I didn't want to risk getting uh, in trouble for you know copyright infringement or something like that. So uh, it's th I do have one image, but uh, but but uh, the, the, most of them were, I took out. There we go. Do I have, yeah. Okay. Got to turn it on first. Okay. So we talked a little bit about uh, about the agenda already. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. So first question: Why are we even bothering to do an OpenStack deployment? Right. <clears throat> I like this little uh, this little cartoon right here because you know this is kind of the typically what happens in an enterprise, right? The the the, the grand mantra for 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 large enterprises: Don't get fired, right? And uh, there's the, nobody got fired for buy BM, buying IBM. I'm going to buy Windows because that's what everybody else is doing. Uh, that even happens in the open source world where, where <clears throat> people will say, um, I'm going to buy, go, go with this particular Linux distribution because that's what everybody else is doing. Uh, <clears throat> But at some point in time, you had to figure out how you're going to differentiate from your, from your competitors. What are you going to do differently? Uh, and at that point, <clears throat> You can't just expect some magical thing to happen. It, it, it's going to take some time and effort. Now, in the uh, in IT right now, we're, IT is really kind of besieged, kind of like our superheroes right here, uh, by the people around them. Right? IT is kind of under attack. You've got the the, the CFO people. The finance people are saying, cut all your costs. I wanted ha cut your budget in half, but I want you to deploy 40% more services uh, next year. You have the uh, line of business people that are saying, you know, you guys, it takes me six months to provision a VM. I can just go run my credit card out on Amazon and spin something up right now. And if it breaks, then I'll just make you fix it later, even though you knew nothing about it uh, in the first place. Anybody else had that happen? OK. Yep. So, <clears throat> so the IT is really coming under siege. You know, like, Kill them all. All right, so let's talk about just some of these some of these questions you need to to, to think about. We, in my experience, <clears throat> in talking to customers and successful people, ninety nine percent of your uh, time for for implementing your cloud is going to be sent, spent in meeting rooms, right? The actual, and, you know, for those of you who are here for the uh, for the for the set, the previous session, Cameron had his uh, his his appliance we have for speeding up the process of deploying a, an OpenStack cloud, uh, <clears throat> and it, you can we can we can literally deploy a cloud out. We we consistently can do it in in a day, maybe two or three. Uh, the longest ones we've done have been like two or three because customers keep saying, "Oh, well, you did this. Well, let's try and do it with this and shift the requirements a little bit." Uh, but we can do that quite quickly. So most of the time that you're going to be doing and what's going to determine your success is all going to be in the meeting rooms. You have to be talking to a lot of different groups. You have to involve all your storage guys, your networking guys, your end users, your finance people. All these people have stakes in what's going to happen in your cloud. And so you need to make sure that you are talking to each and every one of them so that when you get to the end of the process, um, <clears throat> there are no surprises for anybody. All right. So. The first basic question you have to answer for yourself before you can go out and deploy your cloud is, what problem are you trying to solve? Is it, I need to sound relevant in the press because I'm tired of analysts asking me what I'm doing and I don't have an answer around cloud? 
<clears throat> that's one possible uh, reason for your goal. That's not necessarily the best reason to invest and do a multi-million dollar cloud deployment, uh, but it has happened before. Uh, <clears throat> usually you want to say, okay, our problem is that our developers and our QA people, they need to be able to iterate through things faster, and so we need to be able to provide these services for them. That's awesome. Another one is, like we talked about, we've got the guys over in the line of business that keep going out to Amazon and spinning up instances, and we need to make sure that we provide them the services that they need to be able to do the self-service stuff so that they don't have to wait around on IT anymore. And that can be a very different cloud from what you're doing if you're doing something that's targeted towards developers and QA, right? Because it's, it's different levels of people uh, <clears throat> and different skill sets. So your, your storage decisions might be different. Your performance uh, optimizations may be different. So you really need to understand what problem it is that you're going to uh, be trying to solve with your cloud. Otherwise, you're going to be starting to run into problems. I need to make sure I've got a timer up here so that I don't uh, run. I can talk for hours on this stuff. Huh? OK. <clears throat> All right, and I've already used up 10 out of my 15 minutes. We were only on the first question. All right, how much of your current infrastructure do you want to keep? in your current workflows. And what I mean is um, <clears throat> implementing cloud is a lot of change, right? Uh, there's the whole, you know, we've got the pets versus cattle mentality, and we want to go to a cattle mentality so that we can just throw out any given server at any given time, and nothing's going to happen, and it's all going to be unicorns and lollipops for everybody. Uh, but in reality, when you're trying to mitigate risk, which is what most large enterprises are trying to do, you need to be able to leverage your existing investments. I just spent $5 million getting my VMware stuff all paid for for the next couple of years. I got I spent $100,000 in training all of my staff so that they can be up and running. Uh, if you go to your CFO and say, I want to throw that all out the door and let's go, go get KVM set up uh, and retrain all of our staff and reduce their productivity for the first year while they're trying to figure out how to adapt to the new hypervisor and the new infrastructure, uh, can you cut us a check for that? that's going to be a much more difficult conversation than saying, OK, we've got our VMware stuff right here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and leverage that. We may add in some additional KVM on top of that uh, so that you can do things like, um, um, you know, let's run our production stuff out on our, to our VMware. But we can give the devs and the QA. We don't want to pay the VMware tax for those guys. So let's go ahead and put them up on Zen or KVM. Uh, maybe you want to have some Hyper-V out there as well, so that if you want to have, so that if you have Windows workloads, you don't have any uh, incremental costs uh, for spending up additional uh, Windows workloads on those. All those things, all those different hypervisors, you can run concurrently under OpenStack, and it's all supported uh, by SUSE, and that enables you to to be able to uh, <clears throat> to be able to leverage your existing investments and simply add on to it. Which, which mitigates your risk. Now, the nice thing is, because you can do, say, your KVM and your VMware at the same time, you can gradually spin up more KVM and take down some of the VMware as you want to transition slowly over in a natural progression into your natural attrition. Uh, you can do that. Uh, but it also gives you the escape hatch that says, if I'm doing the KVM stuff and it's not giving me what I want, I need to have my DRS on my VMware. I need to be able to integrate this into my existing disaster recovery scenarios. Um, <clears throat> Having that escape hatch uh, gives you the ability, uh, w with OpenStack, you can just simply transition more of your hypervisors back over to VMware, uh, and it's not going to change anything on the end user experience uh, for, your, for your, your line of business. All right. So <clears throat> then we get into the what are the business and technical requirements of the process, project. Um, so this is things like, OK, what are my SLAs? Right? What are what are my end users expecting in terms of uh, downtime? Um, am I running uh, are my e-commerce platform on here, uh, like Walmart was, has been talking about? Uh, in which case, you know, if I'm down for two minutes, then with them it's probably like a billion dollars that they lose. I don't know what it is. Uh, <clears throat> I probably should. They're my customer. <laughs> but in any case, um, <clears throat> but yeah, it, it, you know, it, is are you going to have that level of Uptime you're going to require for your cloud, uh, or is this going to be more of again more of a uh, if it's down for 30 minutes uh, because we're rebooting control nodes, uh, then then that's not a problem. These are these are the kind of things that you want, that I'm talking about here in terms of business. What are your SLAs? What are your in, what are they uh, looking uh, to demand from you? Uh, constraints for the project. <clears throat> Generally, you're you know, there's the you can have it what you can have it fast, you can have it quality, uh, or you can have it cheap, and you can pick two of those three at the most. 
and usually the uh, <coughs> usually somebody one from the finance wants to pick all three, but uh, at some point you have to figure out what, what are the actual constraints on here. I, you know, do we have a specific deadline that we have to de hit? You know, going back to the Walmart thing, they were talking about their, you know their business is cyclical. They have a they have a shutdown that happens in uh, November where everything freezes and you don't touch anything on the IT until after January, right? <clears throat> if you have a if you have a hard and fast date uh, like that, that's going to change your approach uh, compared to if it's okay. It can take as long as it, it needs to, but we just have to keep the cost down as low as possible. Uh, so the, you have to weigh those competing priorities because that is going to impact uh, how things come out. <clears throat> What additional resources do you need to have to have a successful deployment? This is kind of my generic catch-all, but um, this is something along the, along the lines of: um, Do I need to make sure that I have? Um, <clears throat> you know, do, I, do I need to add in temporary man count? Do I, am I going to need to have consulting resources? Do I have uh, the expertise in-house uh, to be able to to do this, or do I need to farm this out to somebody else, or do I need to hire? Uh, additional people. Uh, understanding what resources you're going to want to have is, again, going to make a, a large, even directional, uh, you know, destinational change in, uh, in terms of your cloud deployment. And I know that these are very kind of broad and overarching uh, things that I'm asking you to consider. Uh, but in all honesty, uh, all these questions have come up in all of the uh, people that I have talked to about clouds in one form or another. Uh, but in, the, in terms of answering those questions, the, why, the answers have been so wildly different uh, between all of them that it's really hard to say, okay, here's a list of five things that you need to make sure that you do in order to have a successful, you know, make sure you have you know, your NetApp storage or your Ceph deployment or make sure you have this plugin for Neutron. The, all these things uh, are going to be different depending on, what you, but depending on your specific location. Not location, situation. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So this right here is just kind of a, a, a diagram I put together on an airplane uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, just kind of laying out, this is kind of the, the, the service architecture of what a cloud deployment is going to look like, right? <clears throat> so you've got your, your control plane here in the middle, you've got your, um, your, your, high, your VMware, not VMware, your VM hosts uh, down here in the uh, orangish yellow, and then you've got your external stuff that you're going to be integrating with, whether that be tools, in the SUSE world, that's uh, SUSE Studio or SUSE Manager that you're going to integrate with that. Maybe you have an external vSphere cluster that you're integrating with. Um, all that kind of stuff is out there. OK, so how does this all come together? So let, let's, let's, from a technical perspective, let's start looking at, at some of the specifics here of how do you want to group the control plane services. So typically, <clears throat> you're going to have, uh, as Cameron was saying in the, in the, in the previous uh, session, uh, Usually what you say is you want to break out specific services such as your database uh, and your, um, your networking and you want to be able to have those on their own independent clusters. And your cluster usually needs to be three nodes so you can have quorum and stuff like that. That means that if, you have, if you've broken out that, the, the database and the networking and then you have the stack for the remaining services, you're talking about nine nodes just for the control plane. That may not be fi uh, financially feasible. So you can do some stuff, uh, for example, <coughs> In this right here, I have a, a four-node cluster where they're all clustered together, uh, but you can use affinity groups to pull some of these uh, no all these services by default out onto separate nodes, and then if a node goes down, it will start to combine things to get you up to to keep you running while you fix the other nodes. So, so you can do some stuff like this to kind of uh, save your costs if you don't want if if you can't invest the infrastructure to have the full you know, a dedicated service for each, each thing. You can use affinity groups inside of your, uh, inside of your cluster to be able to, uh, to take care of that. <clears throat> and that, that does bring, down, bring up the point of, is a highly available infrastructure important? I, you know, it, do you want to invest the time and effort in this? Um, we have, at SUSE, we've uh, actually taken a lot of that time out um, with our admin appliance for, our crowbar appliance for, for deploying. It's, I mean, it's just drag and drop. My, my, my stupid little marketing thing that I say is if you can operate a power button and you can operate a mouse, then you can deploy your cloud and you build your cluster. That's yeah. not that great. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> you'll have to do things like define out your shared storage. What do you, how do you want to do that? What's Stoneth mechanism? Anybody know what Stoneth is in the uh, HA parlance? Uh, okay, Stoneth stands for, he's, he's raising his hand, he should, he, he's actually done this. Uh, shoot the other node in the head, 
<coughs> is what it stands for. It's a fencing mechanism. So if you have a cloud, uh, if you have a cluster and you have three uh, nodes, uh, if one of them starts acting crazy, the other two turn around and phew, shoot it in the head, uh, put her down. Uh, because you don't want that one, that one uh, node to start interfering with the, with the operations uh, and the services running on the, on the, the rest of the cluster. So you, you, there are a number of different ways you can do that. Uh, you can tie into, say, the IPMI device and actually pull the uh, power from the IPMI. You can actually, some of them, you can tie into the, uh, the actual <coughs> powers, the power controls for the APCs and whatnot. And you can pull the power that way. You can do an, uh, via SSH. You can do, uh, there's one called SBD, a split brain detector that enables you to do it. There's, there's lots of different methods for doing this. Uh, if you have questions about this, please feel free to come talk to us. And, and we have some uh, suggestions that we may be able to help you work out. How am I doing on time? Not very well. OK, what, how, how much time do we have? We're going to, I need to give you some time. OK. so. You have to decide what hypervisors you want to support. Uh, we support KVMs and uh, VMware and Hyper-V. Uh, you can do all those concurrently. Uh, I gave one scenario earlier where you would want to have those kind of things. Uh, how do you want to handle storage? Um, if you're doing something that uh, is very high end, it has to have guaranteed execution times with low latency uh, and uh, good performance. Uh, you're going to want to have a NAS. Uh, backing in, uh, backing up that, uh, backing up that infrastructure. Uh, whereas, if you're going to be just doing uh, just you know standard Dev QA that's not necessarily performance, uh, that doesn't have those performance requirements, maybe you can do something like a Ceph or a Swift as your as your backend. Use local disks, whatnot. We definitely want you to use Ceph. Yeah, not him. <laughs> He's from NetApp. He wants. He wants. You, you can use both of them together. You can have you can have multiple storage backends. So you could have. You're, you can have your you can have your high end stuff roll out on, onto your NetApp or whatever, uh, and then you can have the lower end stuff uh, roll out onto your uh, onto your stuff. Okay. Uh, what Neutron plugin do you want to use? Uh, this is going to impact uh, Spiff's uh, various things uh, in terms of your hardware interactivity. Uh, there's you know there's direct uh, if you're going to be using VMware for example, you have to use the uh, VMware plugin for, uh, in order to be supported by VMware. Uh, so you would need to do that. And then also, if you're going to do that, you need to make sure you use the VLAN uh, encapsulation tool, not GRE, because vSphere does not understand uh, GRE, and you will not be able to communicate effectively, or at all, with your uh, VMware hosts. That's, that's kind of a bad thing. I would think so. OK, <clears throat> networking. So uh, these are the networks uh, as it's commonly set up using the, the SUSE setup. And so uh, these are all, we have defaults that are in there. And these are all really just kind of based around um, you know, getting it out the door kind of stuff. So I want to walk through each of these networks really fast uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and talk about how uh, your decisions here will impact you down the road so that you can uh, plan appropriately for your networking. So the admin no network, this is the network that you use for doing the actual Pixie uh, deployment of your, your bare metal systems uh, and whatnot. Because it is, uses Pixie, Pixie does not understand VLAN tags. Right? So it cannot be a tagged network. It either has to be a flat physical network uh, that can be isolated, uh, or it has to be untagged to the ports. You have to decide how you want to do it, but you have to do it. <clears throat> The fixed network, what this is, is the internal communications layer for the cloud. It's, it's the default network that every uh, guest workload by default is going to come up on. You can tell it not to go up on there, but for the most part, everybody's on this one. So the, your subnet range on your fixed network right here, that is going to directly impact how many VMs you can deploy on your cloud. So if you pick a, pick a class C network, that's a 24-bit subnet mask, how many, how many instances can you run in your cloud? 253, because you have to have one for the router. <coughs> That's a trick question. But yeah, but you, you've, you've given yourself a hard upper limit. Um, you don't want to make networking choices that are going to limit you down the future. So you need to take that into account. Uh, the SDN, this is for the neutron stuff. Uh, again, <coughs> how many overall network connections uh, do you want to be able to use uh, within, your, within your system? You need to make sure you, you give it an appropriate thing. Public, this is the, the uh, this can be the smallest one. This, the public network is used to expose the API end service, endpoint services to, uh, to the outside world. So at the very most, you were talking about 13, 15 
IP addresses if you have a single, uh, you know, if you have a single IP address for each of the different services, uh, you break them all apart. Uh, you could have as many as 13, 15 uh, different ones. In, in, in practice, you'll probably have about three or four. So it's, it's not, it does not have to be very big. The floating network, however, <clears throat> this is how you expose the guest VMs to the outside world. Uh, and this one is important. Now, the, the floating and public, they both have to be within the same subnet range, okay? So you reserve the, the first X number of uh, addresses for your public network, and then all the rest of these over here over for your, for your floating network. <clears throat> the number of uh, addresses that are in your floating range are going to directly impact the number, the number of uh, guest workloads that you can expose to the outside world, expose outside of the cloud. Yes? So you have them both, uh, the 126, 126 slash both? Yes. Yes. Would you normally scrub them so they're not overlapping? No, they have to overlap. They have to overlap. So, um, <clears throat> so you would have, uh, for example, by the default, uh, the public is like 192.168.126.2 through 10 or 15 or something like that. And then the floating starts at like 130 or 150 or something along that and has a range of like 50 or 70 uh, diff IP addresses in there. But they're both on the same subnet because they have to be able to communicate with each other uh, and they both have to be exposed to the outside world and you want to do that through a, a single continuous. So you have to make sure that you have enough space in whatever net mask that you're using to be able to handle uh, both of those uh, networks concurrently. Uh, and then storage, if you're Swift, this is going to directly impact uh, how many um, Swift nodes uh, you're going to have. You know, if you have, again, if you have a 24-bit uh, sediment mask, you're limited to 254 uh, Swift nodes uh, that you can use. So, all right. So, coming back to our uh, diagram, and honestly, I cannot remember now because I did these slides a couple weeks ago, and I can't remember why I came back to this diagram, but I'm sure it was important at the time. Um, <coughs> Just a reminder that we've got, uh, you know, the, the blue right here, these guys are the networks. So again, this is just kind of illustrating the fact that the admin network is gonna determine how many of these hosts you can have. Software-defined network, you have a little bit more flexibility on here. Uh, and then you've got your, your flexible network and, uh, not flex, fixed network is, is in here as well. Uh, and the public floating network to expose out to the outside world. All right. Additional considerations, we're going to move fast. Identify a patching strategy. Are you going to just, uh, in, in the admin server, we have a bar clamp, which is a plugin that says, uh, I'm, going to I'm going to run out patches automatically. Uh, you can do that. You can do Susan Manager. You can do a manual process. You can do the cross your fingers and hope you get away without it, uh, which is what most uh, people end up doing uh, for the most part. <clears throat> And then you have to think about, uh, you know, if I'm going to do this as a proof of concept versus a production, uh, what are going to be the differences between those, those uh, deployments? And, and am, I, am I okay with those differences from an evaluation standpoint? You know, you're networking. You don't necessarily have to be as, as uh, <clears throat> you, you have a lot more room for error on your networking when you're doing the uh, POC versus the production. Uh, you may do just a single uh, control plane or put all the, have a single cluster and have all the services on one for the POC, but then for production, you spread them out. Uh, you may wait to do your Active Directory integration until after you're doing production, those kind of things. Uh, additional, additional operation. If you do all these steps, Fist Pump Boy is going to think you are awesome and he's going to tell the world about it. And this is going to be your CFO because, he's, or CTO or what, whichever one that you roll up to, uh, who's going to uh, thank you for putting together this cloud. <coughs> Probably not going to, the, the C level people don't usually do that to IT people. I've been the, I've been the IT guy where the CEO decides to pull, to, uh, to uh, move up the uh, moving, uh, moving offices uh, from two weeks from now to today. <coughs> and then while we're doing that, um, doing that move for them, he threw a party to celebrate the move that none of the people who were actually doing the move could go to because they were actually doing the move. So we're sitting there racking up servers and screwing stuff in and bolting stuff in while they were eating, sipping margaritas and stuff like that. Yay. All right. You're awesome. Okay. We do have documentation, suza.com slash documentation, uh, suza cloud five, or if you just go to the dot com slash documentation, uh, you'll, be able, you'll be in the shape there to uh, be able to find all the different stuff that you need. All right, so that's it from me. I'm gonna turn the time now over to uh, Jeff, who's going to speak really quick. See if, I get, see if I get some sound here. Yeah, okay, that's good.
while I'm getting hooked up here, uh, let's see, do I have? Okay, I got HTML. Briefly, uh, tell us, tell a quick story here while I'm while I'm getting set up. I thought I was trying to think, you know, how would I uh, go about um, explaining, you know, what why NetApp with with SUSE with SUSE Cloud Five, and uh, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Uh, I, there's a, uh, there's a f kind of a repeated thing that, that we do at NetApp in our senior leaders training, and uh, I wanted to quickly tell a story. I do have mostly technical content here, but I will, uh, I'll move on. So we do this thing where uh, they bring in all the engineers and the senior leaders, they get them together, they, um, they, they separate them into groups, they set them down, they bring in boxes, and in the boxes are bicycles. Um, and they give them a, a tool set, but the tool set doesn't have all the tools they need actually to make the bike. So this creates a situation where the groups have to work together. They got to go around and you know borrow, beg, and steal to get what they need to get to get it done. Uh, thank you. They uh, you know so and then they don't have very much time. So they don't have the, they don't have the tools they need. They don't have enough time. They got to put these bikes together in a limited set. They're there with all the high level execs. You know Tom Jordan is our C CEO is there, and they finally get to a point where okay they call time. Some of the guys are the guys that win you know or get their bikes together are, are very happy and proud of themselves and. Uh, Okay, at that point, you know, and some people just have a pile of parts because they don't know how to put bikes together. So it's a big range, you know. At the end of that, they, they come in, they take all the bikes or the parts or whatever way, and they say, great job. Uh, but what you didn't know is that we're giving these bikes to school children. So they income the school children. They bring the school children in. These are the bikes you're going to get. And so there's a big, wide range of reactions, you can imagine. The guys that did a good job are thinking, wow. We put that bike together really well, you know. The school kid's going to be riding this thing. The guys that didn't do such a good job, or you know, cut corners, maybe they didn't put their screws in tight enough. They're sitting there, they're thinking to themselves, "Man, wish I'd have spent a little. <laughs> wish I had a better bike's building skills." <laughs> so the the reason I tell this story is that's how we look at building our products in NetApp. And so why would you pick NetApp? You can build, you know, obviously with a lot of other things. So. Our value is that we, this is what we've been doing for, you know, over 20 years. Uh, Data on Tap has a very long history. We, I mean, so when we're building our, our storage appliances, we're thinking about, you know, these appliances are going to be running medical workloads. They're going to be running, you know, people's SAP installations. They're going to be running payroll, you know. Um, it's not acceptable to say, sorry, you lost data. It's just not, it's not something that we're built for. So <laughs> that's the value prop. Uh, and now I want to dive into the actual, uh, so now I've kind of explained why would you pick NetApp to use with a SUSE Open Cloud. If you have important workloads you want to run in the cloud, uh, this is a, an architecture that will support, you know, two to 200 compute nodes, uh, compute nodes, because as, uh, as we were discussing earlier, we have a three cluster design where you have a data cluster composed of three nodes, a services cluster of three nodes, and a network cluster of three nodes. So, Obviously, a lot of a lot of horsepower, a lot of capability and bandwidth there to uh, to support a large, growing number of compute nodes down here at the bottom, um, and then obviously mediated by the SUSE OpenStack Cloud Five installer. You know, it does all the pixie booting, discovering, and all that. So let me let me move ahead here. Just a brief overview of, of NetApp uh, architecture. So basically, you know, you think of a FAS a NetApp FAS unit. It's a it's a physical box. It has disks in it. Uh, and moving from the bottom up, um, as far as our architecture, we have aggregates, which are basically, you know, groups of disks, RAID groups, you could th or groups of RAID groups you could think of. Uh, we have what are called storage virtual machines, which are kind of a grouping of IPs and storage that can be moved between these physical units. So they're actually virtualized; they can be migrated on the fly without without an outage. Um, you can so it's non-disruptive operations is what we're all about. As I was saying, we're building these things to be up. Uh, if we need to do maintenance on snow, we can move actually move resources off of it. Okay. Uh, at the higher level, you have flexible volumes that sit on the aggregates here, and then finally you get to the where the actual services you know hit the network, um, where you're either serving NFS or iSCSI, which we're using both of those protocols in this design. So we move a bit. Uh, we also have the capability to have mixed disk type on the back end. So if you need flash. You need uh, spinning media, you know, SATA disks uh, for archival, whatever. We can support anything from Flash to SAS to SATA, whatever you need. Uh, well, a lot, of, a lot of capabilities, including deduplication, you know, instant snapshots without uh, performance hits. Uh, what with flex clone technology, which is basically a flex clone is a uh, a writable snapshot. Um, so you can create a snapshot, immediately start writing it, and then the data that gets written is just the difference between the snapshot and what you actually need to to, to store. So. 
As far as the, uh, the deployment process here, there's some preparatory steps. Um, I linked at the bottom there. If you actually, if you want to, if you, those of you who are curious want to see the actual architecture of the deployment guide uh, that we worked on, that Susie at uh, Engineers and I worked on together, you can go to that, uh, that Google link there uh, and pull it up. Um, there's a lot of detail. Obviously, I don't have a lot, <laughs> enough time to go in, into full detail over uh, all the details. But uh, so basically, in a nutshell, the preparatory steps are um, you want to set up your switch ports. Uh, for link aggregation, so you have you know high availability, failover at the link uh, link layer. Uh, you're going to create or modify a storage virtual machine. What I was talking about in the diagram, the the the, the middle piece of the architecture that can actually move between nodes. Uh, that's where you're going to be serving your NFS and your uh, iSCSI data from. You need to create the and set up your iSCSI disk for the shared block device fencing. So we were talking about Stoneth earlier. They shoot the other node in the head. Uh, in this design, we're actually using iSCSI disk as the Stoneth uh, fencing device. So those are done through multipath HA, so there's high availability there. And basically, it's kind of like a voting disk where the, the Stoneth nodes communicate through, uh, to each other through those disks. Uh, and then moving up the stack, uh, you have your databases, PostgreSQL, RabbitMQ, you know, for the queue, uh, Cinder, Glance, uh, FlexVols for where you're going to actually store your Cinder data and your Glance images. Uh, on the glance images, we recommend deduplication. You might get up to 90% space savings with that. If you think about, you know, you have uh, a lot of Linux VMs are all based on the same image. You can actually deduplicate those blocks at the 4K block level and reduce your data storage down to, uh, greatly. Uh, you can use it in, uh, in production as well on the center volumes. Uh, and then also, there's an optional uh, um, section of the, of the deployment guide for if you want to actually support live migration. And what this means is in a case where you have two hypervisors, um, you want to be able to move that, a, a VM from one hypervisor A over to hypervisor B, you need to have shared storage to mediate that. So um, that's done through NFS mounts. And then when you get in the actual deployment, uh, you build and configure. We went through that. You build and configure the uh, SUSE OpenStack Cloud 5 host. You modify the network. I'm going to show you that in just a minute, how you modify the network for the storage, particularly for the storage network. Uh, you run in SUSE install cloud, you perform discovery, you know, pixie boot your host, they come up, they're seen, they show up in the GUI as we saw earlier. Uh, you install all the nodes with batch edit. Um, once you've got your nodes up, then you can hook them up to the block devices I talked about, the iSCSI block devices, so you can do your stone fencing amongst your three hosts. And then you deploy your HA controllers and the OpenStack services. So that's very high level, but. Uh, I'm not going to be able to obviously go into everything, but I'll show you sort of key parts. And you can, if you, I'm going to, I'm going to pull up the link to the uh, reference architecture again at the end. You can pull that up and see the actual details of how to set up the Stoneth devices and fencing and all that stuff. So basically, what I did in, in this case, uh, so pretty much went with the the sort of the recommended um, the SUSE networking scheme, with the exception of the uh, the storage network. I had to modify that to get out to my actual storage network in the lab. Um, so this is how you would do that in the in the YAST um, interface. So we're, you know, obviously you can see that you're setting a, a range of addresses here, the minimum IP address, the max IP address, and you do that by clicking down on the uh, the edit ranges button down here at the bottom right. Yeah. Uh, and then this is what it looks like if you've discovered all the hosts. Uh, the, the obviously the, the compute nodes could vary greatly. That could be three nodes or it could be 300 nodes. Uh, but what you're going to see is you're going to have, you know, you basically your foundation is going to be your, your data services. That's where, you know, your, your databases live. Um, your controllers, uh, where all of your control services, Keystone, Glance, Sender, all those things live on the services um, cluster. And, and the cluster is the target that we deploy these things to. We're not deploying to a single node. Um, when you drag and drop in the interface, it's actually to the cluster. So. And all of the, obviously all the, uh, the network services run on the network cluster. Neutron. This is where you would actually go in and uh, you could select uh, you know, the, your batch edit mode and you can see how I've select, I've grouped these in the batch uh, in this with you know, their intended role, whether they're controllers, compute, network, what have you. You can go through and set them all. You can boot all your, all your nodes up, they come up, you recognize them, you select what role they have within the, uh, within the OpenStack deployment. And then when you click, you know, you, these are actually completed here. If they, if they weren't, you'd see a, uh, over here, you would actually see checkboxes. But once you do that and you reboot them, they come up, they're complete. Now this is how it looks. Okay, so 
this is a little bit of a, a kind of a two screenshots. This is down here you can see, well, first of all, Pacemaker is a service that mediates the high availability amongst the nodes in the, in the, three, the three nodes in its cluster. Um, and as I said, we're using Stoneth with the shared block devices. So in the guide, you'll see it, it talks about how to, uh, how to create the LUNs on the NetApp side, how to map them on the host side. Um, and then once you've done that and actual, you have that sort of plumbing in place, then you come to your pacemaker proposal here. You put in the block devices that you've set up. You hit save, you hit apply, and boom, it does all the magic. Uh, there's no manual configuration of anything. And I have to say, uh, what a pleasure it was working with Synstaller. Really good job on it. Uh, tell your, your engineers, uh, it's, really, it's really a good tool. Um, it's a, it's a quality, uh, quality piece of work. And, and so once you have all these, uh, these clusters built, you'll see, you'll see your three clusters showing up. You know, they're, they're ready, they're available, and then so you're on to the next, next process. Postgres SQL, uh, here we're using shared NFS storage, as you can see here. I'm giving it an amount, and all the details for this are in the guide as well, but I'm just kind of giving you the highlights. So basically, your, your databases are now going to go on NFS storage. You got block devices for clustering of the fencing, and then shared, shared NFS storage for your database. As you can see down here, uh, we actually select the data cluster as the target for our PostgreSQL database. So it's running on a cluster of three nodes, if that makes sense. Uh, Glance, um, we set up uh, to, you know, to use uh, NFS here, version 4.1, which is PNFS, so it's highly available. It's almost like um, a Lua or multipath, for those of you who are familiar with storage protocols. Uh, but a way to sort of dynamically figure out where can I get my data from without having to worry about failover. The client is smart enough to know how to fail to a different target, which has a, a big advantages in a large cloud. Uh, here, uh, we're starting to install our services. So ex in this example, our Keystone server gets dragged to the uh, services cluster that we've set up in the same process um, as, as in the other clusters. Uh, okay. And then you get down to actually pulling the, the NetApp sender driver, which when you, you know, when you go to do a sender create for your block devices for your nodes, um, there's a very nice bark lamp here. You can select either seven mode, uh, on tap in seven mode, or cluster data on tap. You can select your protocol if you want to use iSCSI or if you want to use NFS. The, um, the management address of the NetApp FAS that you have. Uh, we recommend HTTPS for security, obviously, um, 443. Give it an at, you know, your username and your password here, um, and you have to specify the name of the V server. In this case, the name of my V or my SVM, uh, my storage virtual machine was SUSE Cloud Pi. And then you have to give it uh, at least one. You can give it multiple exports here. Um, if you have, if you want to have more than one export, you can have one that's thin provision, one that's thick provision, one that has deduplication, one that's mirrored. You can have all kinds of different options on the back end when that app. So you can create what we call, a, we call it our storage service catalog, but basically it's a sort of a list of services that you can, depending on your needs. So when you go and let's say you're in Horizon, you wanna click the drop down and select a disk type. You can say, well, I want, to, this is an archival, so I'm gonna put it on dedupe or, you know, whatever your need is. You know, if you need high speed flash disk, you have a disk type for that, you select that in your cloud. So it's very flexible, it gives you a lot of uh, capabilities uh, for different use cases. Yeah. Yes. We're done. So <laughs> this is basically it. Um, sender, uh, and this is my last slide. So if you want to go and get the, uh, the reference architecture, there, there it is at that link. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>